We have made you welcome. We make you welcome this morning. And church, church loves you. But most of all, God loves you this morning. Our opening hymn this morning is page 180 if you want to be turning there. Uh, Brother Gary Wiseman, will you stand and open our worship service up? Father God, Lord, we just thank you for another time of being in your house, Lord. We thank you for all those who made a choice to be here this morning, Lord. And we ask your blessing upon those that's not here for whatever reason, Lord. Pray, Lord, that everything that's done here this morning, Lord, is just uh, done, to, done to satisfy your will, Lord. And we just, again, just thank you for your mercy and your grace, your long-suffering, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. For you that don't already know, we got Brother Paul Keener from the state. Uh, Brother Evan Hayes is buddy, right hand man, and uh, he's going to be bringing a message to us. And for you that wasn't here for Sunday school, you missed a good, good Sunday school lesson. Page 180, nothing but the blood.
<laughs> Did you notice the question that was being asked as he sung him song in each verse? Would you do service for Jesus your king? Would you be whiter, much whiter than snow? Would you be free from the burden, from the passion of pride? Would you free would you be free from the burden of sin? A lot of questions there. If you get right with Jesus, you can say yes. Amen. We're going to go to the Lord in prayer on our next hymns uh, as we open up to 177, one page over. Uh, I know Leona had a prayer request back there for her brother this morning who's in the University Hospital in Columbus. Uh, she says there's no, no hope for him up there, but Jesus, we know, is the healer of all things. You tell us his first name, Leona, so we can pray for him this morning. <coughs> Gerald. Gerald. Gerald Clark Keith. Gerald Clark Keith. Uh, let's remember this uh, gentleman, brother, for, for the, you know, just for the grace. For the great, God's grace is sufficient for whatever we go through. And I suppose when we come down to the last mile, God's grace will be sufficient for this uh, chosen ones. Somebody else. So Charlie, my family always needs the church's prayers. Remember, buddy. Yes. You know, he, uh, he's doing pretty decent. He's he feeling pretty good over the weekend. So. Amen. And uh, remember the Terry Ross family. You know, he lost his life this week here. And, uh, remember Mikey Sprague. He fell and broke his hip. Yeah, and, I heard that. But uh, and, uh, just continue to remember Bob Rice. Amen. Remember little Alexis. She's traveling to Washington, D.C. on a bus this morning. Yes, Paul. Uh, I have a sister-in-law who is in California. Her name is Janet Castle. Janet. Janet Castle. Castle. Yes. Remember her prayer. Let's remember this prayer request this morning. Uh, I'm sure I'm the church for different lists. I know it's been a long time. She got out of her wheelchair Tuesday and out of her booth at the same time, which I can't believe. And her foot was sweating. Her foot's what? It's swelled. Swelled, and yeah. Uh, it's all grabby. <coughs> uh, Lord, I'll, I'll just put her in the Lord's hands. Amen. I mean, she's only 41. I don't know if she's going to be able to work or what it is, but when I went to put ice on her foot, I just thought, Lord, please, she needs a good healing for her feet. Yes, amen. So just remember her in prayer. Let's remember Melissa this morning. Charlie, remember Lloyd this morning, too. He's uh, battled that jaw all week. It's really bad. Let's remember Lloyd this morning as uh, he's still battling whatever they're trying to take care of in his jaw and it's not, don't seem to be worth whatever it is, but I know that we know the man that's the great physician that can take care of him and he is will. Also remember Dorothy and Larry this morning. Larry, I guess they feel good and Dorothy's sugar's way low, Doc said. Let's remember Dorothy and Larry this morning. Charlie, Ed McClellan passed away yesterday. His family members in prayer. Yes, let's remember the loss. The, the family that lost the loved one. And then my family, the salvation. Okay. Remember Daniel's fire. They're about to need a prayer. His kids will come back at some stage. Let's remember Danny this morning. Uh, Let's remember the churches around about us. Let's remember Brother Paul as he brings a message and also for traveling mercies for whichever direction he's heading when he leaves here. Uh, let's pray for traveling mercies. Charlie, I remember uh, Cheryl uh, Clark. She had surgery over her back about four weeks ago. 
and uh, I got a call over yesterday and she was being uh, put back in uh, Kenton Park Hospital there to, to do surgery again this morning at 7.30. She had five places in the incision that had an infection so they were going to have to operate to try to get that out and she's not a Christian. Let's remember Paula's request, but most of all, let's remember the soul. My husband lost his grandma a couple nights ago, and the whole family stayed in the heart, and they're not saved. And so they're not saved. Uh, please remember the family is probably asleep. Okay, Jim, let's remember this request. Let's continue to pray for Kathy and her family. Amen. Yes. Remember Bible school coming up? Let's remember Bible school and the other things, uh, camp and stuff that's coming up, things of the church, you know, that we need to remember to pray for them daily. Uh, remember this great America that God gave us a place to serve him in. I mean, there's, it don't look good, but still this is the best place there is to live. There's elections coming up in the near future, but uh, pray that God's will be done there. I'm sure we all got burdens and things that we want the Lord to know about and help us with throughout the rest of this day. Uh, let's all stand as we sing, When I See the Blood. Brother Jamie, will you lead us all in prayer this morning?
saved. Yes. Almighty God, as we call in your holy, your precious name today, God, we know it's in you, Lord, that we live, we will forever be. Lord, as we bring these petitions, Lord, we know, Lord, it's only you, God, that we pray, Lord. Greater is he that's with us than he that's in the world. All these that are sick and afflicted in the hospitals and those who are God, we can touch one. God, pray for everyone that has cancer, Lord, or heart, or kidney, or liver, or lung disease, whatever it may be, but most of all, for them that are sin sick today, God, I pray for them to discourage for those, Lord, God, or to grieve them because they've lost the love. Would you fill the void in their life today, God? Be the God of all comfort. So, Lord, anoint Brother Paul with power from on high, God, as he brings us the word of God. Thank you for your mercy, God. Thank you for your grace. And help us to stand this morning, God, to stand and do all our standing for you. Build the church up on the name of Jesus Christ. Bless every song, bless every testimony. Father, in Jesus' name, let it be done. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank
going to be first with a song or a testimony this morning? So you got a song this morning? Uh, Jamie, you got a song this morning? I want to stand up and say I love the Lord. Amen, Gary. Thank you for all the travel mercy. Yes, amen. Thank you for Charlotte reporting my issue. Not a new stamp put in there. Well, praise God. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody testify while the girls are coming.
thankful that you have brought us to this hour. We ask God that you would empower us to do your work. And Lord, would you open our ears, open our hearts that we may hear, that we may understand. We pray for your direction. Guide us now as we try to deliver your word. For we ask in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I'll be looking at the book of Genesis chapter 3, very familiar text. Uh, I, I must confess to you, uh, I had a change of heart what I would do this morning and decided yesterday this would be what I would do. I felt led to, do that, to go that way. And I hope that you'll be much in prayer for us. 
uh, a number of things that uh, concern me. Uh, I'm about I'm about teaching. I'm about the Sunday school or the church's educational agency, and Sunday school has been the most effective tool for that. Uh, I like small group, but Sunday school seems to bring everybody together at the same time, and it seems to let us do things together, and uh, I like that. It's a place uh, uh, that the kids can learn, and uh, uh, Jesse, let me plug for a minute, Randall House, their curriculum, uh, every age is on the same page, so what they're studying upstairs is what they're studying downstairs. And I really like that because the teaching is done in the home. It's not done in the church. Uh, uh, you only have, uh, I read one place that uh, the average student, the church only has them 40 hours a year. And that, that sounds like so little, but that's all we've got them. Learning takes place at home. So I'm going to try to prepare uh, parents and teachers uh, this morning with what I'd like to do. And I'm going to start off just a little bit backwards, if I may. If we look at psychology, psychology is defined, and I'm giving you a simplified definition, as a study of human behavior. Now what that means is, that's what causes us to act the way we do. I want my actions to reflect my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want Him to be the reason that I do everything that I do. So my psychology is pretty easy to understand because I'm His. I want to look like Him. I want to walk like Him. And sometimes that's hard to do in this world. That brings us to the second point. That's what is psychiatry. That's an interesting field. Psychiatry is defined as a study of diseases of the mind. Now, why this is on my mind is because lately, more and more, we're dealing with people who have dementia and, and uh, Alzheimer's. And it's in my family twice, and we're dealing with it. And my wife's dealing with it on her side of the family, and I'm dealing with it on my side of the family. And so, so I've looked at this. What that means is our memory... And it's a study of why we remember what we remember. Now, here's the importance of that. I want my memory to be filled with this. Amen. I've listened to I've listened to a person with all times. My aunt died in in her in her uh, closing years, I was, I was the person who took care of her. I handled her affairs. And as she got older, she would talk about things that she would never talk about before. And she talked about some things that were a little bit embarrassing. Now, when I get older, they'll say, you know, just like we do to, with Grandma or Grandpa who has all time, we say, well, that's just Grandma, that's just Grandpa. I know a man who was a Christian for a long time and he has Alzheimer's. And when you're around him, he's going to repeat stories, good Bible stories that he's heard years and you're going to hear them over and over and over. And he'll sit in the same 15 minutes and say, did I ever tell you about this? And he'll tell it to you again. He'll do it three and four times. I want my mind to be filled with this. I want my actions to be filled and in compliance with this. <clears throat> so let me give you some fundamental behavior patterns. Now again, this is for parents and this is for teachers so you can understand life. And it's simple. If you look at Genesis chapter 3, I'm going to give you a real fast outline of it. We find the key to understanding Genesis chapter 3 is found in verses 6 and 7. That has to do with the fall of man. Sin caused the fall of man. If we were looking for the key verse, <coughs> it would be found in verse 15. 
I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. <coughs> Genesis 3 is divided into three parts. The first part, verses 1 through 5, it has to do with the great temptation. We're all tempted. Verses 6 and 7, as we told you, that's the fall. Verses 8 through 24, that's the judgment that came as a result of the fall. <coughs> Please forgive me, I'm having some allergy problems and I'm hoping it doesn't hinder me too much, okay? I want this morning to deal with verses 9 through 13 and the key verses, verse 10. Before I start, <coughs> I want to give you something. It's called I Wear a Thousand Masks. I don't know the author. It's unknown to me. And there are many variations of this. This is a variation that I like because I feel most identified by it. I hope you will be fooled by the mask that I wear. I wear a thousand masks. That I'm afraid to take off because one of them is really me. You will see really who I am. I'm likely to give you the impression that I'm secure. Confidence is my name. Coolness is my game. And the water's come and I'm in command. And I don't need anybody. But I hope you won't believe me. My surface may seem smooth, Beneath I dwell in confusion, in fear, and in aloneness. But I hide this. I panic at the thought of my weakness and I fear of being exposed. That's why I frantically create a mood to hide behind. A nonchalant, sophisticated facade to shield me from your understanding. But such understanding I so desperately need and I know it. If I don't keep the mask in front of myself, I'm afraid you'll think less of me. You'll laugh and your laugh would kill me. Think about that for a moment. How many young people have been hurt by a laugh? They've been exposed, laughed at. I've been through that. So I play a game. It's a desperate pretending game with, with facade of assurance and without and a trembling feeling within. And so my life becomes a front. I idly chatter to you in suave surface tones. I tell you everything that's nothing. A nothing of what everything of what's crying within me. So when I go into my routine, I hope you won't be fooled by what I'm saying. I hope you will listen carefully and hear what I'm not saying. I want you to know how important you are to me and how you can be a creator of the person that is in me. If you choose. It will not be easy for you. A, a long conviction of worthlessness leads me to maintain my distance. The nearer you approach me, the blinder I may strike back. It's self-defeating, but at the time it seems the safest thing for me to do. I fight against the very things that I cry out for. But I'm told that empathy is stronger than the walls and therein lies my hope. I desperately want you to understand me in spite of my distancing tactics. My name, I'm every child who's ever come to the age of reason. I'm every teenager that's crossed your path. I'm every man. I'm every woman. What causes us to be this way? What causes us to be afraid when somebody calls on us to do something? Yeah. What causes us to stand up without assurance of what we're standing for? Well, I think we can see this in the text so let's take a look at the text, if we could. Genesis chapter 3, beginning with verse 8. 
And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife Eve hid themselves. Wait a minute. They hid themselves from the presence of the Lord and God uh, amongst the trees of the garden. And the Lord called, God called out to Adam and said, Where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Let me read that to you again. I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid. I was naked, so I hid myself. <clears throat> Verse 11. And he said, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten whereof I commanded you, thou shouldest not eat? There are four things I want to give you this morning. You see, the core of who we are, every one of us alike, is sin. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, a, <laughs> I'm not near the sinner you are. It doesn't matter. The core of people is sin. Your core, my core is sin. You know what? If you want to attack me, I can take it. But you say something about one of my kids, I'm going to get ugly. Now come on. Amen. Isn't that the way it is? Amen. Do you know how hard it is to give up your children? I remember one time there was a missionary. And she told her dad, I want to go to the field. And the dad said, no, honey. He said, you can't go. I want you to stay right here. Find I want you to get married right here. Give me a lot of grandkids right here. I want you to stay right here. And things did not go well. Finally, she said, Dad, I'm going. And she went. She was on the field just a few years and lost her life. And news came to Dad. By this time, Dad had learned some lessons. He said, you know what? If God wants her, I've got another one to give him. Do you know, I, I find it difficult when this coming week, I've got to sit down and figure out and travel for 13 hours driving time. Now, there was a time when I could handle that pretty easy. But you see, I've got a son that lives in Canada. I've not seen him in a while. And I want to go. I want to go. I want to see him. And it's pretty important that, okay, I, I, Edwin, I'm putting in some days here. We get this done, get this done so I can have a couple of days off. Well, yeah, okay, we can do that. Work it out. You see, even for those of us who are Christians, there's a line that we'll cross over if we're not careful. Because the core of us is sin. Now listen to me. Do you remember the time when Adam walked with God in the garden? He was perfect and upright. God would come down and Adam said, yeah, said, we'll name this a giraffe. We'll call this a lion. We'll do this. He named all the animals. And he took care of all of the garden and I understand, and you know, this goes beyond my study ability, but the scholars tell me that up until sin occurred, there was no death. Now, I don't understand how carnivorous animals live, but I'm made to believe that there was not, they were not carnivorous. They were plant-eating kind of things. I don't know all of that, but I know that there was a time when everything was in harmony. It's kind of like... We're in love. We got married and we're on a honeymoon and it doesn't end. But then Satan reared his ugly head. Do you know how he did it? He looked at Eve and he said, this will make you better than what you are. This will make you smarter than what you are. And she said, well, you know, 
wow, yeah, I want to do that. I want to, I, if I were to ask you this morning, wouldn't you like to be a better at whatever it is you do? You would say yes. But where's the line that you would cross? Because you see, Eve did this, but that's not the sin we're held accountable for. It was Adam's sin because Adam, when she gave it to Adam, Adam didn't say, and I don't know the depth of theology of this, but Adam didn't say, no, honey, we can't do this. He took an eight. Willingly, he took an eight. He gave in. And when he did, he sinned because God said, thou shalt not eat of this. So what happened to him? He was controlled. Or he, he was afraid. Uh, uh, his, his core was, was sin. Listen, uh, we need to understand it in Psalms 14, Psalms 53, and in Romans 3 and 23. We are all sinners in the sight of God. We've all disobeyed. We've all sinned. There's no big sins, no little sins. We've all sinned. We're all sinners. You see, we should see ourselves as the desperate people we are and ask the question, what can we do? But we don't. You see, when we see God's voice, hear God's voice, and this is God's voice. You know why people don't like this book? It exposes their sin. Yeah. This tells me what I am. Yeah. Come on. That's why people don't like this book. We see people read it. They read it to try to find fault in it. But you know what they're running from? They're running from themselves. They're running from God. They're running from the fact that this book says we're all sinners. Wait a minute. No. You have your truth. I have my truth. No. This is the truth. This is the truth. Well, what's that do to us? Well, first of all, how many of you are ready to face God right now as you are? Let me tell you something. If I had to face Him the way I am without Christ, I would be definitely be scared, afraid. Because without Christ, I am unclean, I am undone, I am a sinner, and I'm going to be put into a place where those kind of people are. That does something. You see, this produces fear. Now look, look at what Adam said. I heard thy voice. What happened next? He said, I was afraid. You see, the core, the core of people of sin, what sin too does, it produces fear. The fear is, I saw your word, I heard your word, and I became afraid. What's there to fear? Well, if we, look at, if we look at Jeremiah, you remember the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Behold, I formed thee in the belly. I know thee. Before thou uh, camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Ordained, uh, uh, ordained. Uh, uh, then I said, Oh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a child. But the Lord said unto me, Say not, I am a child, for thou shalt go all and I shall send thee and whatsoever I command thee shall speak uh, be not afraid of their faces for I am with thee uh, uh, I am with thee to deliver thee saith the Lord listen I am afraid but you know what if God is on my side I cannot lose wait a minute and please forgive me. And, I, and these young girls have made a real strong impression upon me. And I, I watch them get up here to sing. And they did so fearing what was going to happen. I, I've got I've got granddaughters their age. Okay, I know what goes on in their minds. And you know, uh, uh, someone said, "Which one's your favorite?" The one I'm with. It's simple. Okay, and I I know how they think. I've got a good relationship with them. And I know what they get afraid of. My Lauren, she's, uh, she, she shares things with me and I, I think, wow, that's a pretty big shoe I've got to fill for her. My Emily is so really very special because she, uh, she uh, you know, she, she, 
she lives a little further away and it's a little harder to be around her. But she's so special to me. And I watch the fear they're going to and what they face in life and I realize, wait a minute, God is with us. But the fact of it is, this word says we're sinners and I'm afraid. Be not afraid. He is our shield. He is our fortress. What happens is we get controlled by fear. I've watched this situation with my sister-in-law. And I'm watching different members of the family. And they're fearing what's going to happen. Because she's very close to being very critical. And we're so afraid. Listen, let me tell you something. God's in control. God is in control. And I'm trusting in Him. But fear causes us to do things that we wouldn't otherwise do. But listen to me. Don't be controlled by your fear. This is the heart of who we are. We do things. Why? Because we're afraid to do them. I love to travel. And yes, I travel a little faster than I'm supposed to. I keep it under five to seven over, period. And I'm even brave enough that when I see the flashing lights down the road, I don't even slow down. But I have to because the cars in front of me and the cars were past me, they slow down. I don't know how many times some car comes flipping around me and all of a sudden they're slowing down and they're going slower in the speed limit because they're afraid of those flashing lights beside the road that has another car pulled over. Listen. Fear causes us do things. It is the motivating factor of what we do. We need to understand that. We need to understand we should not be controlled by the fear that's, that's in us. God tells us don't let be controlled by your fear. But here's what happens. Fear produces the motivation. And the motivation is rejection. Oh, wait a minute. Now listen. Look at what Adam said. He said, I was afraid. Why are you afraid? Now listen to me, because I'm going to talk about you here in a minute, okay? I'm afraid because I'm naked. You notice I have on a coat, a tie, and a shirt. I've been into churches where you don't wear a coat, a tie, and a shirt. You wear casual. Oh, okay. I can dress casual. But I wouldn't dare come up here in a bathing suit. <laughs> Why? Because it's not proper. I'm not even sure I like to be exposed without something on the top when I'm at the beach. We cover ourselves. Now, let me show you something. Ladies, I'm sorry. Please don't get mad at me, okay? What's the, first, what's, what, what's the main thing ladies do before they get ready to go out in public? They get in front of a mirror. They get the powder out, right? Get the lipstick out. I don't see a lot of eyeshadow anymore, but do we still use eyeshadow? Some, yeah. Why, why do we do that? I remember a time, and I came to a time when, when you had the churches that believed in makeup and the churches that didn't believe in makeup. What are we doing? We think we're making ourselves more presentable. What we're trying to do is kind of like why I'm wearing a coat this morning. You know why I like to wear a coat when I'm out? Even when I'm casual, I still I go someplace and say, okay, I can take the tie off and I can, I can put a polo on. I mean, you know, but I'm still going to wear a coat. You know why? And I can get really hot up here. I generally keep my coat on. Do you know why? It conceals the fact that I have one arm shorter than the other. Oh, I've had people to lie to me graciously. Have you ever done that? Say, I say, well, you know, I have one arm shorter. Oh, I didn't notice. Listen, what we do is we take what we think are blemishes and we cover them up. The core motivation is I'm afraid that if you know me for sure, you're going to reject me. One of my favorite cartoons, 
And if I were preaching with PowerPoint, and I've done this before, I have a cartoon of Dennis the Menace. How many of you remember who Dennis the Menace is? Okay. Dennis the Menace is up a tree with his pal Joey. Remember Joey in the cartoon? And he says to Joey, Joey, do you know who your real friends are? Your real friends are those who know all the bad stuff about you, but they're still your friends. Amen. Wait a minute. God knows all the bad stuff about you. And you know what he did? He covered him up with the blood. He took the blood and he hide this awful facade that you see in front of you. And when God looks at me, he sees pure white. One of my favorite passages is found in Corinthians. He became me and I became him. You see, I am undone, I am unclean. But he said, because I believe on him, I'm giving you my righteousness and I'm taking your filth. Oh, Isaiah 53, such a beautiful passage to preach on. Because he took my place on Calvary. Why? Because we want to protect ourselves. We, we reject we reject what we think we are. So what we do is we put on a layer. We put on a layer. Sometimes that layer is physical. Sometimes that layer is mental. Oh. Have you ever seen a person who they give you the idea they are, they're, t they're tough stuff. But deep down they're not. They're hurting inside. Listen to me. Teachers, this is for your benefit. A lot of the students you're teaching are going through that, especially, especially junior high and high school kids. Because they're trying to, uh, this idea of, of who they make friends with, who they admire. We need it to be in the church, but a lot of times it isn't because we're in the public school system. And that's a whole different climate. And we take what's going on in the public school system and it's a disgrace. But what they're trying to do is cover up the real us. The core motivation. I reject what I think I am. We learn this from our childhood. And, and, and parents, I did it to my kids. I want to make them look as good as I can make them look. I want them to look as innocently as they can look. A lot of times, that's not what they are, but that's what we want them to do. We want to believe they're perfect, and so we dress them as if they were. But the fact of it is, inside, we're rebellious. And sin has caused a problem. And we, uh, 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 we, we, we get afraid of it. A lot of times, and, and let me just share one thing with you from... from uh, uh, from uh, our Revitalizing Your Sunday School, a passage of scripture in Proverbs 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the ways we should go when he's old and not depart from it. I know there's people, and if this is you this morning, I do not mean to draw blood with you, but listen, I want you to listen to me carefully. I've had people tell me, well, I know I raised my son in church. I raised my daughter in church. I know they'll come back to church before they die. That's not what that verse is saying. If you're depending on that verse to get your child back in the church, I've, I've got some sad news for you. It's not going to be because of that verse. What that verse is saying is this. You take a child and you see what their bent is. You see what God has gifted them to do. And you encourage that. You raise them up and encourage that. And when they're old, they'll just grow in that talent that they've got. That's what that verse means. We need to train them. And God has a purpose for every child, every person that's in this building today. God has a purpose for your life. And that's what that verse has to do. But here's what we're afraid of. My dad did this to me because I'm crippled. Okay. I don't want my child to go through what I went through. Let me ask you a question. What if God wants your child to go through what you went through. Would you cheat that child out of that? Because you, that child's motivation is going to be a little bit differently than yours. And it very well may be, he may be a whole lot closer to God than what you were when you went through it. And he may be an example to somebody else as to how to handle that particular situation. 
But somehow, we're afraid. And so we have to understand that God is in control and that we need to say, Lord, here I am. Here I am as plain and as simple as I can be. Take and do with me what you will. Oh, but I'm afraid of that because i got so many ugly things. If you know some of the things I did before I was saved, you wouldn't even let me in your pulpit now. i got news for you. God has cleansed me. I'm as clean as anybody that's in America today, that's in the world today, because God has cleansed me, and I stand in His presence today because of the blood of Christ. The core, the core motivation is rejection. I'm afraid. I'm afraid for myself. I'm afraid for my child. This produces our strategy. What causes you to do the things you do? What causes it? It's a strategy you pick. So what do, what do we do? Well, I heard your voice. I was afraid because I was naked. So what I did, I, hid, I put my coat on. I hid myself. Oh, wait a minute. This is what people do. There's a lot of people you're looking at, man, they look really, really good. They're not. They've just got a lot of layers on. They've got a lot of masks on. Some people are so talented that they can change masks and you really don't know them from one to another. But that's, that's what it is. You see, we develop these defensive layers. We do it because somebody attacks us, so we figure a way we can defend ourselves from that. We do it because we use defensive words. We come up with, we come up with uh, statements. You see, uh, uh, we get afraid and we don't want somebody to see the real me. Listen to me. I have been, I have been cleansed by the blood of Christ. I love you this morning. I don't know how to love you, but I love you. You see, I have a special relationship with Christ. I have a special relationship with my wife. I have a special relationship with my family. I have a special relationship with you because I'm here. I'm not here. Listen, if, I'm not here because, well, Brother Jamie wanted me to come. I'm coming. I'm here. I'm, I'm here because Brother Jamie asked me to come. He asked me to preach. I'm here for that reason because one... I care about you. Whatever I can do to help you, that's why I'm here. The scripture is very clear on these things. You see, listen to John 4.18. There is no fear in love. Wait a minute. If I tell any one of you I love you, you might ask me to do something I can't do. And that scares me. That's not love. You see, Christ died on the cross for us. He died for you and he died for me. I was one of those people, I went through a, I went through a time in my life when I said, you know what? I'm worthless. I tried to do this, it didn't go right. I tried to do that, it didn't go right. And I thought, I'm worthless. And I said, Lord... Show me in the scripture where you love me. Luke chapter 22, I found it. You see, early in Luke, Luke tells us that Jesus was tempted of Satan. Do you remember that? At the end of that passage, Luke says, Satan departed from him for a season. You never again read direct conflict between Satan and Christ in the Gospels. I thought, where does he care for me? Then you go into Luke chapter 22 and chapter 23. You remember Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane? He went, he prayed. He came back, he found his disciples sleeping. He went, he prayed again. Listen, the scripture doesn't say this, but let me tell you something that I think. If Christ did not die for me, I believe that Satan said to him, Paul Keener's down there in the future. I said, I love him. I, I can afford to love you because he 
loved me. That's scary. The scripture is clear on this. Listen. Let's consider one another. Hebrews chapter 10, chapter 10. Let us consider one another. Provoke one another unto love and good works. Oh, wait a minute. Listen to me. Provoke one another unto love and good works. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is. Oh, wait a minute. We have church like this here this morning at my home church. It's just a little different, a little different the way we do it, but it's still the same thing that's going on there that's going on here. As the manner of some is, but listen to this, exhorting one another so much more that as we see that day approaching, listen to me. Our relationship with one another is not the layers that we're wearing. Every one of us has to have layers on to feel comfortable because, and, and it's appropriate. But we're Christians. We know what's underneath the layers. And underneath the layers of those who are blood-bought is this. I love you. You love me. Wait a minute. Let this love be in you. Let this mind be in you. What? The love that Christ had for us. The love that you have one for another. That's hard. Because sometimes we're afraid. Listen to me. We must not be afraid. We must understand that the mo what motivates us, and that's the core of this message this morning, what motivates us is the love of Christ. What does it do? First of all, it causes us to pray for one another, exhorting one another, praying for one another. Why? Because that day is approaching. What day? A day in which judgment is going to fall. What's going to happen when judgment falls? We're going to see the saved and the lost separated. Uh-oh. There's people that's going to be removed from your life. And I don't understand this. But I'm telling you, the day of separation is coming. And people are going to be moved from your life because they simply did not conform to God's will. They did not take advantage of the time they had to get right with God. But you know what? Now's a good time. Amen. Now is an excellent time. Say, wait a minute. Let me take a look at this. Listen to me. If you can't right now look towards heaven in your heart and see if there is something between you and God, and if there is something there, it needs to be removed. Amen. That's what this service is about. That's what I'm getting ready to do is to give you a chance to take and come to an altar and confess it. You see, the core of who we are is the sin that's in our life. And we need to get it out so that we do not be controlled by fear. That's the only way you can. And so that we're motivated to do what's in this book, that we follow after God, that we may be one in Him and one with Christ. Listen, I don't know what your time schedule is, and I don't know how long, normally I time how long I've been here, but I'm telling you this morning, don't let fear motivate you. Be motivated by love. And we need to come to a place where we say, Lord, cleanse me. Cleanse me. Would you stand with me, and would you bow your heads, and would... Uh, the song leader come. Come on up, Brother Jamie, as well. If you're here this morning, I believe it's okay for me to do this, Brother Jamie. If you're here this morning and things are not right between you and the Lord, if you're here this morning and you're afraid, afraid of what? Afraid of hell? Afraid things are not right? That's as good a reason any to say, you know what, I need to get it settled. Remember the old account, we need to get it settled and settled quickly. We're going to sing a song. And while we sing, if you want to come, the altar's open. I invite you to come. 
If you like, I'll come down and pray with you. If you'd like somebody else to come with you, that's fine. But listen, understand something. If there's fear in your life, it's because there's sin. You need to lay it down. Page 309. You need to lay it down. As we sing, if you're here this morning, you need to come. I invite you to come. Sometimes that fear is there. But understand something. You can't let that fear control you. If there's fear in your life and you need to do something about that fear, would you just slip your hand up and by that say, Brother Paul, I know what you're talking about. And there are some things I'm afraid of. Would you just slip your hand up and say, by that, please pray for me. I'll not come back to you. I'll not embarrass you. But I will pray for you. Is there anyone anywhere in the building? Perhaps you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord. Now, it seems lately most everybody in the church is Christians on Sunday morning. But I know that are we 100% Christians? I don't know that. And I would feel amiss if I didn't give you an opportunity if things are not right between you and the Lord to say, you know what? You need to get right with Him today. It's an earnest thing. It's a decision that you need to make. You need to make it soon. You need to make it this morning. Is there one anywhere in the building? You just slip your hand up and say, Brother Paul, I'm not right with God. Would you pray for me? May God bless you this morning. Brother Jamie, go ahead and take over. Amen. Paul's teaching. I teach today and it's give you my hand. Amen. You, you may be seated. I got uh, some announcements to make. All right. Now, I, I know that, you know, it's that time of year that graduations and stuff are going on. And if you're not here because you're going to a graduation, I ain't going to get mad. All right. I, you got family. I understand that. Just don't stay gone. Okay? Number two, the ladies are leaving Friday for a retreat. Be careful. We need to be much in prayer for them. What time are leaving here at noon? Leaving here at noon. So, going to take the van and probably what they'll do is there's 13. So, you can't fit 13 women's luggage in with 13 women. So probably we'll put the lay the back seats down in Rhonda's vehicle. I mean, you know, they're just going for a day, so they shouldn't have more than four or five bags apiece. <laughs> huh? But what I'm saying is that, that we put all the luggage in with Rhonda, and uh, Rhonda can follow the van up, or the van can follow Rhonda. So that means that Sharon or Susie or somebody will have to drive the van. Sharon's been there and done that before, right, Sharon? Yeah. So, but uh, we do want all the ladies to have a great time and uh, come back fired up, ready to go. Okay? Now, uh, of course, youth group is tomorrow night. Next, two weeks from tomorrow is a memorial. There will be no youth on that day, right? So, 
Okay. Be, be, won't you? No. No. I'll be in Virginia. In Virginia. All right. But anyhow. Uh, tonight in our service, we are going to set aside Brother Johnny Daniels as a deacon. Now, I've talked with Brother Johnny, and of course, actually, the whole board has talked with Brother Johnny, and, and he's prayed about this. And I realize our, our scripture tells us not to be a novelist. Brother Johnny has only been saved just a little over a year, but he's grown tremendously in that year. And uh, what we're going to do, normally you set a deacon aside for a year, we're going to go two years, that we can help Johnny grow more into this position. Amen. And it's not to punish Johnny, it's to help Johnny. And Johnny understands that because, again, we have spoken with Johnny on that. So come out tonight. We will, we will do that as part of our service. Also tonight, uh, again, on the taking charge of your marriage or your household, I will continue in that sermon series tonight on the letter H and uh, feel that God has got something for us. I realize we just had a revival or a series of meetings, whatever you want to call it, just not long ago. But man, we need to be praying for lost souls. I mean, again, our time's running out, folks. And every time that... that that seem like the phone rings or we meet back together, someone else has died or has been diagnosed with a terminal disease of some type or been in an accident. I mean, just everywhere we look. Am I right? You know, the devil's going forth as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we're like a bunch of uh, scared rat rabbits over in the brush just sitting there shaking and shivering and not doing anything about it. Amen? Amen? Can I tell you? The devil's going forth as the roaring lion, but the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed. Amen. His roar's louder. That's what, we've, what that, that's what we don't understand or don't comprehend, right? Yes. Yes. All right. One more thing. Brother Paul and I are working on, uh, he's going to come back and he probably will take two Sundays and do it, but he's going to teach on church growth and revitalization and uh, he's going to come back and do that for us when we can get it worked out and we have some people in our church don't get mad that like to work but we have some people in our church that like to shirk which means let everybody else do the work and we need everybody because if I would ask it, how, all right, let me see the hands, how many people want to see this church grow, every hand in this house is going to go up. But just coming on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night or whatever, it's going to take more than that if we're going to grow this church. We've got to get outside these four walls. And when they get them inside these four walls, we've got to be able to bring them to Christ. Amen. Amen. And it's my family, and it's your family, and it's my neighbors and your neighbors, it's my friends, your friends, that we're working to save. That's our, that's our, that's our job. I thought about the Filipino missionary that, that he spoke at our conference yesterday morning, and one of the points that he hit on is that every one of us are called to be missionaries. We might not be called to go across the sea, we're called to get out and to bring others to Christ. That's what a mission does. Missionary does, right? All right. So, uh, again, be much in prayer for the ladies and, and the conference that's coming up. I hope they come back half as fired up as what the men do. Yes, ma'am. You spoke about the conference. Have you fixed the backlight on that van? I noticed one of them was out. I think it's the brake light. On the, on the white van? On the white van. I'm taking the white van. Am I taking the white van? Anyway, Is the blue one going to be fixed? Is it fixed? Okay. But that's what's true. I noticed that. I didn't, just to break light out? I didn't want us to be pulled over. <laughs> oh, it's just Sharon driving. I never hear the end of it. <laughs> Dave, it, it... Yeah. If it's a brake light, don't hit the brakes, and they won't ever know. <laughs> uh, 
is, is the white one going in the garage on the same thing with the we're going to check the gas tank out as well. That's we had to put a new gas tank on the blue one for you that don't know it. That was just the blue one, all right. But we need to get that we we need to get that brake light checked out as well. We don't want to be running around without a brake light because someone may hit us, and, and that's a huge liability, right? Thank you for letting us know that that was not working. Anything else? All right. Let us stand. I want Brother Paul to go to the back door, if he would, and I'll be right there in just a minute. And I want you to shake Brother Paul's hand as you go out the door and tell him how much you enjoyed his message. Pray for safe travel and look forward to his return to come back to teach us more about church growth. Right? Because we want it to grow. Amen. 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 Now, here we go. Hey!